One sec, uh, let me start up my WebEx. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not WebExing this. I'm just kidding. Um, OK, I, I do have to apologize, though. This is the first time I've ever given this talk. Uh, so I'm even more nervous than usual. And I'm afraid that this will be either extremely long and boring or way too short. So, But I, ha I have like 200 slides. so. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be one of those two. So I mean I'm I'm really happy to be here. This is super exciting. Uh, I'll, probably all of you know this since you live here, but I just found out today that when I type in PDX on my phone, it auto completes to odd, O D D. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's on purpose. <laughs> anyway, uh, hi. Hi, everybody. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I want to say thanks to Godfrey. He did a really great job yeah. in the previous yeah. talk. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to the features of Rails 6. Uh, <laughs> of course, thanks to New Relic. Thanks to all the sponsors. It's really great to be here. I did not know that this meetup was going to be so large. So that's really awesome. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. I am known on the internet as Tender Love. That is my name. Uh, I work at a company called Red Hat. This is where I work. Uh, I'm on the Manage IQ team. We manage clouds. If you have a cloud, that's what we do. <laughs> we manage them. And <laughs> we're hiring. Got to put that in there. They required me. You can email me here. Our code is open source because I work at Red Hat. All of our stuff is open source. So you can go check it out there if you want to. Um, I have two cats. Uh, this, is, this is one of them. Her name is SeaTac. SeaTac YouTube or SeaTac Airport YouTube Facebook. Uh, we, <laughs> we call her Choo Choo for short. Uh, she sleeps on my mouse pad. That is my mouse pad. This is her sleeping on the, <laughs> my mouse. Pad. You can see I can I get to use that much of the mouse pad. That's this is it. She has an extremely long tongue. Uh, <laughs> This is the other, my other cat. He's a little bit more famous, Gorbachev, Puff Puff, Thunder Horse. He also sleeps on the, on the mat there, too. This is a nicer photo of him. And they're, they get along. They're, they're both friends, so they like to sit together on the, on the <laughs> chair together. Uh, so recently, I, I tweeted about this the other day, but you saw they were both on my mouse pad. I bought this. All right, I, I've been getting RSI lately, so I'm trying to, I'm trying to like improve my workstation. Like, this, is, this is a weird thing to me. I've been a programmer for like 15 years, professionally programming for 15 years, and only recently have I been like, you know what? I probably ought to improve my workstation. <laughs> like, I like, I, you know, maybe I should get a better keyboard or a better mouse or something like that. So I, I started investing in this stuff. Anyway, I left. I bought a new mouse pad. I bought. I'm left-handed. I bought a left-handed mouse. This is the first time I've ever owned a left-handed mouse. It's really nice. Like, and now I see why all of you right-handed people use those right-handed mice. Or like, it's like. <laughs> I get it. It's really comfortable. Anyway, so I I, I left a review about the mouse pad on Amazon, and this I'm just going to give you the title here. It says, "I enjoy the 25 to 50 percent of this mouse pad that I can use." <laughs> so anyway, if you go like, there's a link. I'm sure you're all writing that down. The one p uppercase p. Make sure it's uppercase p, five n whatever. You can go view it. Uh, so yes, I'm. I'm on the Ruby core team. I'm on the Rails core team. I'm also on the Rack core team, which is that one's particularly important for this talk. And contrary to Godfrey, uh, this does actually mean that I know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, happy happy 13th birthday to all of you. It's really great. You are now a teenager. <laughs> So I want to cover, I, I need to cover a little bit of how I was invited uh, to this, this talk. Um, so first, I'm going to start off with this. Uh, Jonan invited me to speak here. And this is what he said. Uh, I'm a bad person, and I should feel bad. Well, let me give you a little background on why he said this to me. Uh, so he invited me to speak here, and then uh, he sent me these messages in Slack, and I'm, I don't know if you can read it or not. I'll, I'll read it. He says, you know, so are you in and out next week, or do you have time to play Magic? And I said, well, I'm just in and out. I have to work tomorrow. I have a job. 
right? I got to work. And so he's like, well, I didn't realize one of my best friends is having a birthday party, so I guess I'm going to have to skip. Uh, I'm going to have to skip the meetup. Kind of a jerk move to invite you down and then not hear your talk. And I was like, yeah, this, so this is, this is a direct quote from Jonan. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just want to say, yes, Jonan, that was, <laughs> that, was a, that was a jerk move. <laughs> so I think we need to now always refer to Jonan as Jonan invites people to events and then doesn't show up, Scheffler. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I hurt you anyway. It's fine. It's really fine. <laughs> so, okay. My topics for today. Uh, I am a Ruby programmer, but we're going to be focusing on the web, web stuff today. And, okay, I apologize. You know, this is the first time I'm giving the talk. And also, I didn't realize it was going to be widescreen, so I converted everything to widescreen. So I'm sure all of my transitions are going to be messed up, but please bear with me. All right, so today today we're going to be talking about HTTP2. Uh, we're going to talk about Rack, and we're going to talk about uh, Rails' as request and response lifecycle and Rails Rack HTTP, this stuff. This stuff we'll talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about HTTP2, like specifically uh, what it means to us as developers. So I, I want to I talk about HTTP2, and the thing is, like, I tried reading the spec, and I have like the shortest attention span in the world. I cannot pay attention. I tried reading this thing and I was like, nope, I can't do it. So I actually started working with it and trying to build applications with it. And I want to I want to talk about HTTP2 from an application developer's perspective. Like, how are we actually going to use this? How is it going to impact us as web developers? Because that's what I really care about. The the giant freaking RFC is like, no, no thanks. I I just I'm tired of that. So let's talk about the benefits. The benefits of HTTP2. Some of the benefits are uh, it's binary, which star, not always a benefit. It's a binary protocol, which means it's more compact over the wire, so we can get better, uh, better transfer rates. Uh, it's easier to parse, so because it's a binary protocol, it's easier to parse. We only have one particular code path. Any of you that has tried to parse HTTP 1, 1.0, or 1.1 will know about how annoying this is to parse that. Uh, protocol is to parse. Uh, it is also multiplexed. So what this means is that uh, normal HTTP has to open many, many sockets to your web server. So for example, there, you know, somebody comes to your website, they're fetching a bunch of assets from your website. The browser will open up tons and tons of sockets to your server, saying like, I need uh, a bunch of these, right? HTTP2 will not do that. It only opens up one connection to your server and multiplexes all of those requests. And what I mean by multiplex is it's just doing multiple requests and responses over one socket, right? And we'll look at some actual code that uses that later so you'll kind of understand a bit better what I mean. Uh, it also does header compression, so it takes all of your HTTP headers and compresses those and saves, saves uh, data over the wire. Uh, it also uses SSL. And I put a little star by that. It doesn't have to. Earlier versions of HTTP2 required SSL. The final one does not. Um, but what's interesting about this is when I was testing it, uh, browsers, so right now the only released browsers that support it are Chrome and Firefox. And those two will only do HTTP2 over SSL. So even though the spec says it doesn't need to be over SSL, browsers only support it over SSL today. Uh, now, the big thing is, in my opinion, is uh, server push. This is one of the big features of HTTP2. And what this means is we can say on the server side, like, hey, um, I know you're going to be needing these particular files. I want to push them out to you. So I'm going to give them to you in advance. So rather than the browser having to parse your HTML and see, oh, uh, you're using you know, all these CSS and animated GIFs and stuff, I better go download those, we can say no. You're really going to need that, you know, animated Justin Bieber GIF in advance. So we get you. You can send that down. Uh, so the way you can tell that you're using uh, H2, I'm going to call it H2 from now on because HTTP2 is too long to say. Um, like I kind of struggled with this at first, so I am sharing it with you so that hopefully you don't have to struggle uh, in the same way that I did. Uh, the way that you can tell is if you go into Chrome and you put in this special URL, you can see the connections that Chrome is actually making. This is really awesome. Here's an example of what it looks like on my machine. It'll just say, 
I don't know if you can read this in the back or not, but it'll just say right here I have one line because of one open connection to localhost on my machine. So this is one active connection, and you'll see right here it's like localhost 3000. Great. And it'll tell you the protocol to, it'll say right next to it, it's HTTP2. So you can see that. And it'll also give you some other data about it, like how many frames have gone back and forth, how much data you've transferred with the server. Uh, the other thing that you can do is, uh, say you have, you know, you're looking at your website, you can pull up the, um, or you, well, right, yes, I am new to this, this talk. Okay, so you'll see here I have five tabs open to localhost, and if you looked back in the connection settings, there was only one connection. I thought this was really cool, is that both Chrome and Firefox are smart enough. They know, like, oh, you have five or n tabs open to that particular website, they're still only going to use that one particular connection to communicate with that website, which I think is a really cool feature. Uh, so if you go into the, the other thing you can do is if you go into the inspector in Chrome, and if you right click on this little thing here, you can choose protocol and say display the protocol that you're using for that particular, that particular request. And if you do that, you'll see right here, it'll show the protocol on this, it's all H2 for this particular example. And I, uh, sorry, this is a total spoiler, but here is, this is Rails running with HTTP2. Um, and one thing, if we have time to talk about it later, these, these little things down here on the right, those are all the assets, and that graph kind of annoys me. Uh, and we can talk about why later. Uh, so another interesting thing is if you look at the headers, I'm sh you can't read this in the back, don't worry. All the headers with HTTP2 are lowercase. This is, yeah. Yes. They're always just lowercase. It's always lowercase. What is the case? Lowercase. <laughs> they have a few, there's a few special headers, and you'll notice these special headers because they start with a colon, uh, like for the method. So the stuff that we had in HTTP 1.1 that didn't have a header, like get or the path, those things have like colon method. So you'll, you'll notice those special ones, and they are also lowercase, which is great. Uh, now I just wanted to show, like compare, this is all in Chrome. Let's take a look at Firefox. Firefox is a little bit more difficult. It doesn't show the, doesn't show the stuff on the, uh, I couldn't find a protocol thing, column. But if you look at the, if you click on a particular request and you look at the headers, you'll see one that says uh, X Firefox Speedy H2. And this is super annoying. Like this is actually really annoying to me at first because A, it's not lowercase like these ones below. And B, I didn't send that from the server. Firefox just inserted that to say like, hey, you are using HTTP2, good job. Uh, so that is how you tell, and this is kind of annoying to figure out. Like, this is one of the annoying things I learned while I was messing with HTTP2. So the next thing I want to talk about is Rack. We're going to, we're going to switch gears. We're going to go from HTTP2. We're going to talk about Rack. Then we're going to talk about Rack and Rails. And then we're going to talk about integrating HTTP2 with Rails. Uh, so this is what the Rack API looks like today. So this is a Rack application. You're probably all familiar with this. A Rack application responds to call. It takes an environment, and then it returns an array. Uh, the, the environment is just a hash that contains various information about the request. Uh, and this array that you return is a response, and that has the uh, status, headers, and body in it. And the thing is, this, this works. This API works. This API works, and this API is also successful. It's very successful, and I think one of the reasons it's very successful is because the API is easy. It's a really easy API. We can all look at that and grok what it does. Uh, and the thing is, though, I don't think that that easy API is the main win that Rack gave us. The main reason that Rack is so important to us is because it avoids this problem, which is what I think of as an explosion of dependencies. Uh, what, really, what Rack really is doing is implementing an adapter pattern. And what, what I mean by this is, so. Uh, let's say we have a whole bunch of web servers like Unicorn, Passenger, Puma, all these web servers, they write to Rack, they, they present a Rack compatible API, and then uh, application frameworks like Rails or Sinatra can write to Rack on the other side here, and we don't have to have a whole bunch of different gems. Imagine if we had a whole bunch of different gems for each of these, we would end up with something that's like, you know, Unicorn Rails, Passenger Rails, Puma Rails, WebRick Rails, every single possible combination of web server plus application framework. We would have to have a gem for those things. And this is really the problem that Rack solves. We don't have to have all these gems. They all go away. It's really nice. So the next thing I'm going to do here is a little bit of, I guess it's not trolling. 
this is a, this is a serious thing to me. Uh, this is a comparison of Node.js and Rack. So this is Node.js, a very basic Node.js example, and a, this is compared to our very basic Rack example. Uh, the upper part here, you'll notice the main differences here. Node takes a request and a response object, and it actually writes to those writes to those response objects and reads from the request objects. Where we just take we have a hash and we return an array of junk. Uh, so. We'll just look at this, just keep this, bear this in mind, right? All right, next thing I want to talk about is rack middleware. Now, an interesting thing I noticed playing with Node.js, and I'm sure many of you have played with Node.js, is you'll notice that Node doesn't come with anything. If you just install Node, there's no such thing as middleware, right? You have to install something like Connect, some sort of framework that you have to install along with Node.js, where this isn't necessarily true with rack. When you install rack, it comes with a bunch of middleware which I think is interesting. So we're going to talk about rack middleware, or what I like to call all those effing frames in the call stack when I do puts caller in my controller. So I spend a lot of time looking at Rails and looking at ways that we can improve performance and debugging it, and I do a lot, like I, t I look at a lot of call stacks, and this just annoys the crap out of me. So how does middleware work in rack? We looked, at, we looked at rack's API. This is the very basic API. And the way that middleware works in rack is essentially each rack middleware contains a reference to the next one. So you'll do something like, OK, we'll initialize foo is now a middleware. It contains a reference to the next. Maybe it's an application. Maybe it's a middleware. We don't know. It's going to contain a reference to that. And then when it gets called, it's going to maybe do some stuff, call the next app, do some other stuff, and then return the response. <laughs> so the middleware is all entirely stack based. So what I want to do is, and this is where we get to the uh, extremely, extremely boring part of my presentation is that we're going to look at every single middleware that Rails provides to you by default in development. We're going to look at every one of them and talk about what they do. And this is an application with just one resource, okay? It's got this resources post, and what we're going to do is we're going to run a request. Imagine in our head we're running a request through the system. The request is going to be get users, and we're going to talk about everything that, that uh, happens between the web server and your controller. And we're only going to talk about middleware. We're not going to talk about the other stuff. This is only middleware. So the very first thing that happens is the web server parses this, parses the information from the request, turns it into that end patch, and then feeds it to us. And now we get straight into, straight into rack middleware land. And the very first thing that it hits, the very first thing that it hits is an instance of Rails application. This is the very first thing. This is your app. So this is, it's not actually Rails app. It's the your app, your app subclass is Rails application. It'll be your instance of that. So great, we're done, right? We hit the app, good to go. <laughs> no! <laughs> so this is what your application looks like. Uh, there's actually two calls in it. I included both of them because there's a call to super. So basically what we do is immediately we allocate a request object. And then for some reason, instead of using the request object, we kind of use it, but then we shove some other stuff into the end hash. And then we call super. And then super, what it does is possibly shoves more stuff into the end hash. And then we move on. You'll see here it delegates, right? It's like, OK, app.call. OK, good. We're on to the next one. We understand that one. Great. What is the next one? The next one is called rack send file. Uh, and as far as I can tell, rack send file. I'm going to say the phrase, as far as I could tell, many times tonight. <laughs> this thing is supposed to help send static data. So the content says the send file, or the comment says the send file middleware intercepts responses, something, something, sends uh, something. Uh, now, if we look at the very first line of that, the very first thing that it does is it says, OK, app.call at the end. And then there's a bunch of stuff after it for handling, handling uh, static assets. And then, OK, so what is the next thing that this calls? So this handles static assets. The next, very next middleware that this calls is action dispatch static. And what that does is handle static content. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like we've done this one. Um, 
anyway, so this is this is what the internals look like. So this is it's it's uh, doing some stuff with the env hash, and then possibly calling this other middleware file handler middleware, or it moves on to the second branch and calls the next one. And we're going to talk about the next one. We're just going to move on. I just want you to notice when we're looking at this this code, look how much we use this env hash. Look at the strings that we're using to access the env hash. Just think about that for a little bit. Uh, bear that in mind as we look through this stuff. All right, the next middleware, very next middleware, action dispatch load interlock. Now, this one's actually new in master, and this one is actually really, really awesome in development, and I'm not going to make fun of this one at all. Uh, so it used to be that, uh, so Rails, when you're, when you're running in development, Rails will automatically load constants for you, right? When there's a constant that's missing, it will load that file for you and evaluate it. Now, we couldn't do that, or we didn't do that in a thread safe manner. It wasn't thread safe. So what happened was we had a thing that would just lock every single request. We'd take out a mutex lock, run the entire request, and then unlock at the very end. And what this means is in development, in your development environment, everything has to be served serially. So every single request is done serially, which kind of sucks when you think about how you know, you're sending, like, your browser's like, give me those 10 assets, and it's like, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way through the list. So what load interlock does, this is, this is new in master, this actually makes our constant loading stuff, um, well, it makes the locks more fine grain, so that we only lock when we're actually gonna be loading that particular constant, so we can actually serve up requests in parallel in development, which is actually pretty exciting to me. Anyway, so we're not going to look at the code for that. It's pretty boring. The next thing that we call is active support cache strategy to local cache middleware. I don't know what this does. Uh, it sets up a cache is what it does. If you look at the code for this, it's like, okay, set up a new cache, shove it in as a global somewhere, move on with our lives. Then it calls the next one. The very next one is called rack runtime. And what this one does, this one times your applications, how long your response takes. And the reason that we do this uh, is basically so that we can have so that we can help out hackers execute timing attacks against your system. <laughs> that's like that's the main reason we include this one. No, but seriously, I have no I really don't know why we include this one at all. It does uh, it is actually true, people could use this to attack your website. They could use this to run timing attacks against your website, though the thing is, it's not granular enough to really give hackers too much information. But I still don't understand why we have it in the stack. I think we could remove it. Anyway, this is what, the, this is what it looks like inside here. We get a clock time, we delegate off to the next application, and then we like stick that in the headers. Right, we stick this X runtime in the headers, which is kind of interesting to think about if you think about streaming, because streaming, basically uh, uh, puts off rendering the body. So what does this actually mean? If the body is rendered down here, what does the runtime mean? I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, the next one, the next middleware is uh, rack method override. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it overrides a method, I guess. <laughs> That's literally what it does, okay. Moving on, action dispatch request ID. This one is for sessions, I think. No, 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 no. This one makes a unique ID for a request, but only sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so this is the code for that. Uh, it makes, so it makes a request ID, but it only sometimes makes it. I think it's supposed to be unique per session, I think. I don't remember exactly what the rules are behind that, but again, you'll see, okay, does some stuff, accesses this, uh, and you'll notice, hey, we allocate another request object there, that's nice. Uh, so then we have um, rack logger, and I guess this is for logging, so we'll move on with that. Uh, and it like adds loggers or whatever, and then delegates to the next one. Our next one is action dispatch show exceptions, which shows exceptions. I guess exceptions are cool, so we, we show exceptions in development. That's the thing that shows those nice, pretty error pages, but you shouldn't see those because you're testing, right? Uh, the next one is we're moving along is web console. We use web console because web console is a uh, remote code execution as a feature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it calls the next one. Our very next one is action dispatch debug exceptions, which I'm not sure, I don't know what the difference is between this one and show exceptions was. Maybe this one's for debugging exceptions, I guess. I don't know. 
I thought I saw this one before. Anyway, so moving on to the next one. This one calls the next one. This is for Action Dispatch Remote IP. What this one does is it determines the remote IP address of the person who's making the request. Like, for example, if they're coming from behind a proxy. Like, the proxy might have changed the IP addresses, so you have to actually look at a header in order to figure that out. So it figures out the remote IP for prox this is for proxy support, I think. Uh, the next thing is Action Dispatch Reloader. This is the thing that watches your file system and checks to see, oh, hey, did they modify any particular files? If they did, it's time to go reload stuff. So it reloads code if you change anything. The next one down the stack is Action Dispatch Callbacks. This one calls any callbacks because we need more callbacks and we need more ways to run stuff besides all of these. This is live, isn't it? Can I swear? I don't know. <laughs> all right, the next one is action, Active Record Connection Management. This one uh, cleans up your connection pool at the end of the request. So this one releases database connections at the end of your request. And it, it's very careful to not check out any database connections at the beginning of your request. It doesn't check them out at the beginning. It only checks them in so we lazily check out connections, right? We only check them out as soon as you need them, and then at the very end of the request, we check them back in. The next one is Active Record Query Cache. This one caches queries so that uh, if you execute the same query over and over again, it'll give you the same results each time. It just caches the return value from those. This one is very careful to check out a connection at the very beginning of the request. So. <laughs> <laughs> you always check out a connection. The next one is Action Dispatch Cookies, which sets any cookies. And remember, these are all calling each other. We're still in the line here. We're going through. The next one is Rack Session ID, which I'm not sure how this one is different from the other Session ID one, but this handles another, this makes an ID, I think, for the session, not a unique ID. This is just a session ID. Then we have Action Dispatch Flash. That sets all the Flash stuff on the request. Action Dispatch params parser, which doesn't actually parse the query string. It only parses JSON. Huh? <laughs> OK. Just so you know that, this does not parse the query. It only parses JSON. Uh, the next thing is rack head. This one responds to head requests. So basically, the way Rails handles head requests is it will still render your page. You do it if somebody sends a get or a, if somebody sends a head request, it'll still render the page. It just deletes the body. <laughs> that is how it works. Uh, rack conditional get, this one is for handling cached pages, so we don't do everything in case it's cached, like it handles e-tags, it responds to e-tags. Rack e-tag, that generates e-tags, uh, but I think it may also generate, I don't know. Uh, the next one is action view digester, this one eats your code, and then... <laughs> I think it generates more cash shit. I don't know. <laughs> and finally, we get to the router. Fine. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We made it. We made it. All right. Now, unfortunately, you remember that our application had one resource. This resource was post. And the request that we ran through the system was get users. <laughs> So, ah, 404, LOL. Oops, that's a 400. <laughs> OK, so I worked extremely hard on this next slide, so I want all of you to appreciate it. This is, this is the one that I worked on extremely hard. <laughs> Thank you. I kept, play, I kept playing that song over and over and over again on my laptop to get this timer right. My wife is like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm, I'm working. <laughs> so I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry to take you all through all of that. Like, I'm really sorry to take you through all of that. But I, I wanted to make some points about this. The, the first thing is, why is the router buried so far? We did all that crap only to return a 404. Really to return a 404. We're actually re we're, we're checking out database connections to return a 404. What? Like, that's crazy. 
the next thing is like, why, why are there so many? Why are there so many middlewares? And many of them are like, they seem very similar. Why, like, why do we have these? So what I want to talk about next is I want to talk about rack API limitations. And this is kind of what I wanted to show you is kind of an illustration of one of them. This is one of the, one of the limitations of the rack API is essentially with its middleware. And you may have noticed that as we went through this middleware, there's, there's really only, as far as rack is concerned, there's only one type of middleware. There's only one type. So we have to jam everything into it and you may, everything into that one particular stack. Rack only considers applications a call other applications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And one thing I think it, uh, that's important, I brought up earlier, is the difference between Node and Rack is that Node just doesn't have any concept of middleware when you install Node. And I actually think that was really good for the Node community because they had to come up with their own solutions for that. It actually encouraged uh, competition within the community over routing. Uh, so we only have one type. This is, this is not a good thing. I don't think we have one type. Not every one of these middleware do, do the same thing. You may have noticed each of these, well, I'll talk about that later. Never mind. The next thing I want to talk about is the API itself. If we look at the Rack API, this is what it looks like, again, as a refresher. The first thing to notice, I want to talk about this env hash. I really don't like this env hash. And the reason I don't like this env hash is that we can't change the type. So as a Rack developer, excuse me, I mean on the core team of Rack, I can't decide to change that. I can't change it to a different type of object. It will always have to be a hash. And the reason is, just look at this. There's 153 methods just on hash itself. Everybody is depending on this thing being a hash. So the next thing is like, well, OK, maybe I want to change the keys. What if I want to change the keys? What if I want to change the implementation? I can't touch the keys. I can't touch those because everybody's code just depends on those key literal stuffed right in there. And there's no way for me to deprecate that. What am I supposed to do? Am I seriously supposed to implement every single method of hash, intercept those square braces, tell you, hey, I'm changing this to some other string key? Like, it doesn't make sense. We can't hide the implementation. This is, this is one of the strengths of, oh, oh, is that we can hide our implementation, and this hash is just not doing it for us. So uh, you may have noticed the other thing is like hashes encourage uh, allocations, and you probably can't read this code in the back, but I ask you to look at all those string literals. In Ruby, those strings are mutable, and what happens in Ruby is we actually allocate a string every time that, that uh, string is evaluated, unless you see those freezes on the end, and then it'll be a singleton. So you may have noticed once in a while you'll see a freeze in there. Now this code is particularly heinous because it actually allocates two objects. When you do a hash set, so the key value, if you're setting a string as the key value of a hash, it'll actually dupe that string. So you allocate once when the, when the code is evaluated, and you'll allocate again when you're setting that key string. Uh, we can talk about that later too. Uh, so apps are coupled to these key names. Those are really bad. We're coupled to the implementation of Rack. Hashes encourage allocations. We talked about that. Right in there is our allocation. Now the next thing I want to talk about, which I don't like about this API, is the return value. If we look at this return value, again, I can't change the type. I can't change it. It has to be an array. We have 175 methods on that array. Everybody, is, everybody depends on that thing being an array. It's coupled to the array layout. What if I wanted to move the status to the middle one? I can't do that. It's impossible because everybody accesses the first one as the status. We're coupled to that ordering in the array. The other thing is that this makes streaming difficult. If you look at the, the response code for Rack, that very last thing has to be iterable. So the way that we implement streaming is we have to return something that responds to each and then iterates over it instead of uh, programming like civilized people and using I.O. objects. So how do we fix this? And I think the way we fix this is that we should steal, and particularly we should steal from Node.js. Uh, Node has a very nice request and response object, and I think we should steal from that. We should use objects with very small APIs so that we can replace them at any moment. We can change the underlying structure, the, the implementation of them. So if you look at this, this uh, Racks API, it looks very simple. When you look at that code, that small code snippet, it looks simple, but the actual uh, footprint of the API is very large. So the other thing I want to do is add server context 
add a server context for allocating requests and response objects so that if servers want to, they can implement something specific to that particular server. Then I want to eliminate middleware. I actually want to jettison this from Rack. I want to remove it completely so that Rack has no idea what middleware is, and maybe we'll implement our own gem as middleware so we can have a separate gem for middleware. My suggestion for middleware is that we would have a system where we have three particular types, like event listeners, uh, content filters and content producers. So event listeners would be something like, you know, at the beginning of the request, I do want to check out a connection, and at the end of the request, I want to check that back in. But I don't care what happens in between. I just need to do those two actions. I don't care what happens in the middle. Content filters would be something like gzipping. We, we want to process the content. And content producers are something like your Rails app where we're actually making code. So integrating HTTP2. I want to talk about integrating HTTP2 into Rack. And I have to say this would be extremely easy if we just had request and response objects. We could do something like this, say like, OK, uh, when they call the application, we can say, hey, this is, a, this is a demo application, something I dreamt up but is only sort of dreamt up because I actually wrote it. Uh, we can say, hey, are you an HTTP2 request? If so, I want to push some other stuff out. If not, I'm just going to continue on with my life. right? So a concrete, concrete example, this is a concrete example. Don't read it, the code is too small, but I want to show you that it actually fits on a screen, not too bad. Right, this is an HTTP2 server right here. Uh, right here, we get a headers frame. We get different events during the HTTP2, HTTP2, the H2 process. Here we assign a body to the response and then send, off our, send the response down to the, the uh, client. And really what I want to show you is how big it is. It's not that big. And the thing is, this particular piece of code is actually um, extracted away from I.O. objects. It doesn't, know, it doesn't know if you're using SSL. It doesn't know anything. You could be using a Unix socket. You could be using a pipe. All it knows is that it has an I.O. object. So it's completely abstracted from that. And to integrate this with WebRick is just this. We say, hey, this is all the code it takes to integrate with that with WebRick. And right here, we can say, hey, are you serving up an HTTP2 request? And if not, we call super, and it handles HTTP11. But if you are serving up an HTTP2 request, we respond down there at the bottom. So then I implemented a response object. This is what the HTTP2 response object looks like. And you'll notice that it just inherits from the WebRick uh, response. So you can treat it this, exactly the same way. This is, oh my god, OO programming. Whoa. <laughs> So then we have a request object, exactly the same thing here, and we can say HTTP true, the superclass implements one that's false. So then we have this, this is serving up an HTTP2 response, and you'll notice we're getting a WebRick not found error, but yes, this error is served up over HTTP2. It just works with not that much code. So uh, I was actually really excited about this. Here's, a, here's, my, hello world. here's my hello world response. It actually says, hi, mom. Because I, that's what I always put, because I love my mom. So I always put that in my puts. I do puts debugging. <laughs> this is my puts debugging. And one thing I was really excited about is this took four milliseconds, so that was kind of cool. Uh, so let's look at Rails integration next. Uh, in order to integrate this stuff with Rails, which I have done, I basically take everywhere that we say call with an environment and translate that to call with a request and a response object. And everything that was more of a uh, before and after event type thing and convert that as well. And I just want to give you an idea of what the before and after looked like. This is before. This is a rack lock before. And when we switch to the concept of saying, like, well, we recognize there are different types of middleware, this is what the code becomes. It's, that's it. This is the code. We went from three allocations down to zero, eight method calls down to two, and one conditional down to zero, zero conditionals. It vastly simplifies the code if we just admit to ourselves that there is more than one type of middleware out there. So the conversion looked like this. What was interesting is going through all of these middleware in the system, 12% uh, of the middleware actually allocated a request object, whereas 88% of them just accessed the end hash. And of those middlewares that accessed the end hash, 74% of them allocated strings. So this isn't just. I'm not saying how many objects they allocated from accessing the end hash. I'm just saying that 74% of them did. So anyway, this is the result of putting all this stuff together, is we can actually serve up uh, Rails responses over H2. 
So I want to talk a little bit about H2 issues because, like I said, we're talking about this from an application developer standpoint, which is what I am, an app developer. So we'll talk about H, H2 issues, or I, as I like to call them, HTTP, HTTP problems. <laughs> <laughs> So header values still suck. This is an important thing to take away. H2 solves the wire protocol. It doesn't solve the header annoyances. So we still have to parse headers. Cookies are still terrible. Uh, we still have to parse those things. They still have exactly the same terrible format. Uh, browsers are dumb. This is still true. And what this means is we can push assets twice. Like you may be asking yourself, hey, can I push an asset twice? The answer is yes, you can. And the browser may or may not reject it. This is a problem, right? Because if you push the same asset many times, you're wasting, you know, you're, you're doing something wasteful. But what I think is interesting is that each browser only has one context. So the browser is opening up one connection. They keep that connection open to your server for as long as they can. This is interesting, and I think this is going to have interesting implications in our uh, production environments. You know, typically we're used to the browsers cutting off the connection when we're done, but in this case, they're going to keep it open for as long as possible. And in my, just on my machine, my laptop, if I left it open with my test server, it would be open for days. So each browser has one context open. But what's interesting with this is in development, we can keep track of all the assets that we pushed out to the server or out to the browser. So we can say like, hey, since we have this one persistent context, you know, if I push that Justin Bieber animated GIF once, I'm not going to do it multiple times. Now the other thing I was thinking about with this is when we actually go to production with these things, we can add link header fields for Nginx. So Nginx understands HTTP2 and it'll actually look at your HTTP11 responses for a link header and it'll push those out. So when we, when we deploy this to production, we can actually leverage uh, Nginx to do this stuff for us. So the question is why, you know, why am I looking at this stuff? You know, why, why am I looking at this? So, I'm looking at asset pushes in dev. So particularly, I'm looking at stuff like I wanted to, you know, I want to push these assets in dev because our application at work has tons of assets, and seeing all those things, uh, we don't compress any of them in development. So seeing all those things go through when I'm loading the page is just horrible. I hate it. It really bothers me. So what I want to do is when we have things like style sheet link tags, we'll have a bunch of those or maybe image tags or whatever, I want Rails' ERB processor to automatically see those and just say, hey, I'm going to push these out. I'm going to push these down to the client automatically for you. The other thing I want to use this for is uh, Ember apps with JSON payload. So rather than embedding those in the initial HTML that we send down, we can say, hey, you know what? I know you're going to need this JSON payload when you render the screen. So go ahead and push this JSON payload down, which will be nice because that means we don't have to, uh, we don't have to modify the HTML that goes down to the client. We can cache that easier. Other benefits. All the ones that are listed online, stuff we talked about earlier. But my personal, my personal goal is to make sure that our development experience is fast. The reason I'm looking at this is because I want a fast development experience. So the future work that I'm doing on this, uh, you'll notice I haven't integrated push, uh, server push with Rails yet, which is what I'm working on next. Uh, the next thing I have to do is get the test to pass. Ha, 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 ha. Every one of those middleware that I, we went through tonight, I had to modify in order to work with HTTP2. So conclusion, Ruby's strength is OO. Ruby is very strong with object-oriented programming. We should be using its strength to our advantage. We should be using this to our advantage. The other thing that I want you to take away is that everything is terrible. <laughs> Actually, no, no, it's not. I don't believe that. I see a lot of people like I am up here complaining about all of these things and stuff. It's actually not terrible. Think about web development like 10 or 15 years ago. This is far better than anything we've ever had. I think us as programmers were just super pessimistic. We're like, oh, this stuff should just work all the time. But you know what? It's way better than it used to be, really. So, what I want to say is, I'm doing best, and. You can do best too. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> oh.